Are you kids having a good time? Not kids. You know what I mean. All you children. We're all children, really. I'm still a child at heart. How many of you want to come back next year? Yay! I hope you make it back next year. I want to see you all back next year. Well, tonight, I have some news for you. This message is not to them, it's to y'all. So tonight is your night. If you have a Bible, turn to Mark chapter 10. I loved hearing them sing, Jesus Loves Me. How many of you know Jesus really does love you? It's not just a song. He really does love you. Mark chapter 10, verse 13. I'm in Matthew. Wrong thing. Father, right now, before I start, in the name of Jesus, I just find any spirit that would hinder or block this word from reaching the fertile ground in the hearts of every one of these children. I bind every hindering spirit, every blocking spirit. I bind every spirit from the kingdom of darkness. In Jesus' name. Is that going to work? Yeah, fine. <laughs> okay. I bind every spirit of Antichrist, every religious spirit, Every spirit working from the kingdom of darkness, I speak peace right now in Jesus' name. I bind the spirits of restlessness in Jesus' name. And I, I, I speak to their spiritual ears to be opened right now that they might hear the word of God and heed the word of God in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, are we at Mark chapter 10? Everybody but me. Listen to this, listen to this, boys and girls, men and women. And they brought young children to Jesus that he should touch them. And his disciples rebuked those that brought them. You know, sometimes grown-ups think that children are a bother, but Jesus did not. Even the disciples, hey, you know, get them away. And Jesus said, but when, in 14, but when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said unto them, permit the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of God. Now he is saying that, that the kingdom of God is just like you. That's, this is how we're all going to be in the kingdom of God. Isn't that wonderful? We're just going to play and swim and, and laugh and dance and jump around and... Play video games. No, no video games in heaven. <laughs> but it is going to be good in heaven. You won't miss the video games, I promise. It'll be much better than video games. <laughs> and then he tells them... Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter into it. So see, y'all are examples to the grown-ups how to be in order to enter, enter the kingdom of God. God cares about children. And when I say children, I'm not, that's not uh, an insult to you. We are all, he God speaks to us as his children. We're all his children. How many of you live with someone older than you? Y'all live with someone older than you? Do y'all pay the electric bill? No. Nope. Do y'all pay the water bill? No. When you go to the grocery store with mom or dad or grandma or whoever, do you pay for the groceries? No. Well, in the Bible, if you're not out on your own and paying all your own bills and everything, you're a children. So it's not an insult, okay? When I say children, I'm talking about all of us, but especially to you tonight. In the Old Testament, those that were 20 years old and under were called children. Okay. 
there are three age groups mentioned in the Bible, men, women, and children. Yep. So y'all are the children tonight. Um, <clears throat> now, I know many of y'all have been brought to church as you've been growing up, and I know you've all heard Jeremiah 29, 11. Have you all heard it? Let me tell you what it says. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end, a good end. He thinks toward you. He thinks about you. The Lord is thinking about you. Isn't that wonderful? He thinks about you and he cares about you. But tonight, I want to talk not about Jeremiah 29, 11. I want to talk to you about Satan's plan for your life. You know, God has a plan for your life. When, and we, we talk to you a lot about God's plan for your life. But tonight, I want to tell you that your enemy also has a plan for your life. And so I want to tell you about some things that as you grow up, as you, as you keep going and you get older and older and you go to the first grade and the second grade and the third grade and then you go to junior high school and then to high school and then even to college, these things will help you. Because in John 10.10, 10, Jesus said about Satan that the only reason he is here and that he comes is to steal, kill, and destroy. That's the only thing he knows to do. There is no good in your enemy. 1 Peter 5, verses 8 and 9 says this to you. Be sober, and that means be serious-minded. This is nothing to joke about. Be vigilant, and that means alertly watchful, especially for danger. Because your adversary, and that means your enemy, and then it says the devil. See, God doesn't want you to uh, have any doubts about who your enemy is. The devil is your enemy. And it says that he's like a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he de may devour. Another word that's used when you see it in the Bible, devourer, that's the enemy because he wants to kill, steal, and destroy. James chapter 4, verse 7 says, Submit yourselves therefore unto God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So when the devil comes, and we're going to talk about some of the ways that he's going to come to you, you're going to have to resist him, and that means push him away. Tell him to get gone in Jesus' name. And I want you to know that so when these things come, you know exactly what to do. The Bible says that my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And I don't want any of your lives to be destroyed. That's why I'm giving you this information tonight. So that you can never say, nobody told me. I want you to know his plan. Okay, I want you to look at Deuteronomy 30, verse 19 and 20. Deuteronomy chapter 30, 19 and 20 says this. Listen to what God is saying to you. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. I have set before you life and death. Now, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, it tells us about the blessings and of God, the blessings of God. And it also tells about curses if you don't obey what God says. And so, that's what he's saying. I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Do y'all hear that? Life and blessing, life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, God is saying, please choose life. Choose life. Choose blessing that both you and your seed may live. Now, none of you have children yet, but someday you will. 
and what you choose for yourself is going to have a, an effect on your children. So this is important, okay? So every decision you make as you're growing up, if you obey God, you're gonna get life, it's gonna lead to life, and it's gonna lead to blessings. But when you disobey, you get death and cursings. That means you bring a curse on your life when you disobey God, okay? Now, do y'all know about opposites? Do y'all know about opposites? In 1 John 1, 5, it says, God is light and in him is no darkness. So if it, God is light, but then there's darkness. So what is the opposite of good? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about happy? Sad. Glad. Sad. Kind. Unkind. That's right. Love. Unloved. Hate is the opposite of love. Heaven. Hell. Thank you. Patience. What's the opposite of patience? Impatience. Mm -hmm. What about gentle? Rough. Soft. Laugh. And we could go on and on and on with this. See, there's opposites for everything. And so when he says death, life and death, life, the opposite of life is death, the opposite of blessing is curses. And God is saying to y'all tonight, please choose <coughs> life. Choose blessing. Okay, let's look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1. Here is an instruction that God is giving to you as you grow up. Until you're out paying your own electric bill. It says children, now that means all the way up to 20. Obey your parents. Obey your parents in the Lord. For this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment, with promise. See, there's a promise with honoring, obeying your parents. And this is the promise, that it may be well with thee. You want it to be, believe me, you want it to be well with you. And that thou mayest live long on the earth. See, that's a promise. Yep. But to get that promise, you have to obey your parents. So, now look at Colossians 3.20. It says it again. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Now, don't you want to be pleasing unto the Lord? Don't you want the Lord to be pleased with you? I do. And, and these rules apply to me too, some of them. Now, I'm a grown-up. Now, I, I'm a grown-up, so my mama, I don't, have, I don't obey my mama. My mama doesn't tell me what to do because I'm paying my own electric bill now. <laughs> but I still must honor my mama and my daddy. You honor your mother and daddy. When I visit my mother, I do things for her. I open the door for her. I sit her in the best place. I give her food first and, and all those things because I love her. And so we must honor our mother and father and then we get the promise of life will go well with you and you will live long upon the earth. Now, God hates rebellion. Do you know what rebellion is? It's when you don't obey your, your parents. That's what rebellion is. And since that is your commandment, if you don't obey your parents, then you're not obeying God either. Right? Okay, so he knows, the reason he hates rebellion is because he knows that it is opening the door for bad things to come to your life. That's why he hates rebellion. It's very serious to God if you are rebellious. It brings curses into your life. That's why this whole camp is here. 
So those of us who have not obeyed our parents and have not honored our parents, we got to come here and get it all fixed. Amen. And thank goodness we have Lake Hamilton. Amen. Okay, Deuteronomy, look at Deuteronomy 21. I'm going to show you, listen, I want you to listen to how much God hates rebellion. Deuteronomy chapter 21. How many of you have ever disobeyed your parents? Did you get a whipping, or punished, or grounded, or your privileges taken away? Well, let me tell you what happened in the Old Testament when children disobeyed their parents. Listen closely. If this was your house, and y'all were all somebody's children, your God's children, but let's just say y'all were all my children. And y'all were disobedient. Some of you were disobedient. This is what the law was. If a man or a woman, a parent, have a stubborn and rebellious son or daughter, are you listening? Hello? Okay. Who will not obey the voice of his father or his mother, and when they have chastened him or told them to straighten up and they didn't do it, will not hearken unto them, then shall his father and his mother, listen to this, lay hold on him, that means they kind of grab him by the arms or something, and bring him out unto the elders of his city and unto the gate of this place. Now, y'all all saw that gate, there's a rock uh, wall out there and the, the opening that we drive through is the gate. So we would have to bring that disobedient child out outside of the gate. And they shall say unto the elders of his city, now these are all the elders. We'd all go out there, out, on the, out past the gate, and say unto the elders, this our son or daughter is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard and all the men of this of his city shall stone him with stones until he's dead that's pretty serious wouldn't you say aren't you so thankful that jesus came and took away that law aren't you glad i sure am and you know why they did that this is how much god hates rebellion he brings everybody in the city out there to watch and all those other kids are standing there the children and all the other children are standing there and they are watching this now I believe that if I was one of those children the next time my mama said go clean your room it would be done because who wants to be stoned to death certainly not me and it says in the Bible, that is the way you will put evil away from you. Rebellion is evil, 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 evil. Thank goodness that is no longer the law for us. Now, one of the things that Satan will bring to you to mess up your life, he will want you to not obey your parents. He is going to want you to ignore when they say go clean your room or it's time to go take your bath or whatever your parent says to you and you just sit there that's what Satan will want you to do and if you ignore your mama or your daddy or grandma or whoever is taking care of you then you will be obeying Satan the devil and that is going to bring bad things into your life. Might bring a spanking, might mean staying in your room for a week, might mean no TV. So who wants that? Wouldn't it just be easier to obey and get the blessing? Sure. Okay, why will Satan not want you to obey your parents? Because we read that God had a plan for us, right? A plan, a good plan, a plan for peace. But Satan wants to get you off of that right path. He wants you on the wrong path. He wants you to choose to do the wrong thing instead of the right thing. And if you do that, 
you're choosing death and you're choosing curses. You're choosing the bad thing. And I know all of you are smarter than that. Not to choose the bad thing. Don't choose cursing instead of blessing. Even Jesus, when, when that comes, when, you, when your mama says, go clean your room, and you're giving it a second thought, like I don't want to, or oh, not right now, that's called a temptation. When you decide that you don't want to do what you've been told to do, Satan is tempting you to be rebellious. Even Jesus had that. But when that happened to Jesus, see, when Jesus was in the wilderness, the devil came to him. He had been out there a long time, and he hadn't had any food to eat. And Jesus started tempting him. If you really are Jesus, the Son of God, then why don't you turn those stones into bread? Well, that was a temptation. Because you know what? He could have done it. He could have turned that stone into bread. But what he did was he used a scripture that he had learned when he was growing up. And he said, uh, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And that's what we should do too. That really is the true bread. This is the true bread. So Jesus said, it is written. He said that to the devil. So when the devil comes to tempt you, you don't have to do what your mother says. Well, I want you to think immediately about the bad thing that's coming if you decide to do what he tempts you to do. Think about this scripture. It is written, children, obey your parents. Satan, you're trying to get me in trouble. You are wanting to bring something bad to me and I don't want it. I command you to shut up and get out of here in the name of Jesus. It is written. That's how you beat the devil up. See, we don't have weapons. You can't stick him with a, with a knife or anything. You've got to use the word of God. That is your weapon. So listen to these scriptures and I call them bullets. See, you load your gun. So when he comes, you can draw that gun and shoot your bullets. It is written. And then you tell him. And he will flee because you know what? He hates the word of God. He don't want to hear it. The, the second thing that he's going to do is he's going to bring wrong people into your life to try to be your friend. Especially, the word says that he is especially after the seed of the righteous. He's not after the seed of the evil. He's already got them. But he is after the seed of the righteous. And if your mom and dad love God, you are the seed of the righteous. And you become like bait to him. He is sniffing you out to try to tempt you to do wrong things. So he'll try to bring somebody who is not the seed of the righteous to pull you into darkness. Remember the opposites we talked about? Well, that's what he wants to do. Look at 1 Corinthians 15.33. I'm going to show you something. You need to remember this. 1 Corinthians 15.33. Okay, here we go. Here's the next one you need to remember. What was the first one? Children, obey your parents. Okay, here's another scripture. 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says this. Be not deceived. Evil company corrupts good morals. Did you hear that? Evil company. Bad friends it are, is going to corrupt your goodness. Now, I've heard people say, but I am good, and this person needs God, and I want them to be my friend so that I can have a good influence on them. But you need to remember, be not <coughs> deceived. Bad morals corrupt good morals. Can y'all say that for me? Be not deceived. 
bad morals corrupt good morals. So when you meet a new friend, you have to decide whether they're going to bring life and blessings your way or are they going to bring death and cursing. Jesus said this day, God said, I, I bring, I put before you life and blessings or death and cursing and you're going to choose which one you have. Lots of times we've made the wrong choices and we end up with cursings and, and we're headed to a pathway of death and I don't want that for you. I love you and Jesus loves you. We all love you. Everyone sitting here loves you Amen. and we want you to have a good life. Amen. Let's look at Proverbs 22. 24. Proverbs 22. Twenty-four. Okay, boys, listen to this. Boys, especially listen to this. Girls too, but I think this needs to be heard by the boys. Make no friendship with an angry man or an angry friend. You got somebody that's walking around angry all the time, wanting to fight all the time and pushing people and being mean. The Bible says, make no friendship with an angry man and with a furious man thou shalt not go. Why? Lest thou learn his ways and get a snare to thy soul. Listen to what a snare is. A snare is a noose for catching animals. Has anybody ever used a noose to catch an animal? Well, when you rope a horse or a little calf, that's not really a noose. Is that called a noose? But it kind of works like one. This is what the devil's doing. He's whipping that thing around and you make friends with an angry person and whoop, He's got that rope around you and he tightens it up and you've got a snare to your soul. Serious. That's a serious thing. Or it could be a hook. Y'all have all seen Captain Hook. He didn't have an arm. He could just reach out there and hook somebody. You catch a fish that way. Catch a fish on a hook. And you know what? It's not easy to get that hook out. It's barbed. Amen. It takes some work to get that hook out. The best thing to be is don't let the hook get there. Yes. So don't make friends with an angry man. Um, there are good hooks. Good. It's called a soul tie. Up here at Lake Hamilton, we call that a soul tie. Yep. When you take, make friends with somebody, you get a soul tie. It's like having a noose around each of you. Um, let's, I want to show you a good soul tie. 1 Samuel 18, 1. 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 1. Now this is after David killed Goliath. Y'all know that story? Goliath represents Satan in this story. Goliath represents Satan. And we, God's children, represent David. And so we have the victory. But anyway, after David killed Goliath, the king wanted David to come live at his house. He didn't let him go back to his daddy. He was so impressed with David, he said, hey, I want that one in the castle. So he brought David to live in his castle. And da uh, Saul had a son named Jonathan. And it says, that there's the soul of Jonathan was knit. Have y'all ever seen anybody knit? They take loose strings and use these sticks and before long you got a blanket. And you could take a t-shirt, a cotton fabric, and you and me could pull on it and pull on it. That thing would be ripped up after a little while. But you pull on something knitted, you're not ever going to tear it. Something that's knit doesn't tear. 
So that's how close of friends they were. They, it says their souls were knit together. But now I'm going to tell you about another uh, friendship that was not good. And you can jot down these scriptures and read it on your own. It's 2 Samuel 13. This is the friendship of, of a, a young man named Amnon and a, a young man named Jonadab. And Jonadab was, it, it says Jonadab was a subtle man. He was kind of sneaky and he was a schemer and a plotter. He, he worked for the devil, Jonadab did. He told David some bad advice. And that's what you, you got to watch for this too. Because now we go into those opposites. You can get good advice or you can get bad advice. But Jonadab gave Amnon bad advice and Amnon ended up dead. Now you need to be really careful who you listen to and what they tell you. Let's just say you grow up and you're with a group of kids and you are children, young people, you're teenagers now, and y'all are all friends, and someone decides to drink alcohol and get drunk, and he's driving the car. Come on, man, let's go. Let's go to the park. And they all pile in the car, and because he's drunk, he has a car wreck, and your life is ended because of his bad decision. Do you see how important that is? And it says when you obey your parents, it'll go well with you and you'll live long upon the earth. But when you get into situations like this, it could cause your life to end before it's time. We don't want that to happen to you. So when you're growing up, be very careful who you choose as a friend. And I don't want anyone to judge a person who is not a good friend as opposed to a bad friend. Because Matthew chapter 7, let me read this to you because y'all are young, but I've already heard some of this, and I want you to know what you're doing to yourself. Matthew chapter 7. You know what? I'm telling you this from personal experience. When you think you're better than somebody else, and you talk about what's going on in their life, it comes to your house. That's a spiritual law. You need to remember that. Girls, when other girls are around, and guys, this is more of a girl thing, really. <laughs> I hate to say that, but it is. Girls like to talk. Did you see that dress she had on? She thinks she's something. That's what girls do. They get jealous, and they, they pick at each other, or, um, They'll do something, and people find out about it, and they'll stand off to the side and say, I would never do that. I would never. I would never do that. Well, I'm going to tell you something. Growing up, I did that. I would never do that. Or, even worse, my kids would never do that. And believe me, they've done it all. Everything that I judge somebody else for, let me tell you how real it is. The minute you come out, it comes out of your mouth. There's a purchase order being written, pay to the order of. It's just like when you go to a restaurant, I want a hamburger and french fries, and they write it down. That's called a purchase order in the old days. And you would turn in that purchase order, and then they would deliver what you ordered. Well, this Matthew chapter 7, verse 1 says this, judge not. Y'all say, what did I say? Judge. And judge is when you talk badly about somebody and you compare yourself with them and of course you're the better one. It says don't do that unless, so you won't be judged. This is a key of the kingdom. You know God says I leave with you the keys of the kingdom. This is a, a, another way to look at it. Whatsoever thing you loose on earth is loosed from heaven. If you judge, you get judged. If you be kind, you get kindness. If you have compassion and, and, and help people, you get help and you get compassion when you need it. That's a key. 
Hang on to that one. Not only will you be judged, but the same way that you judge them and the same thing that you judge them about, it says ye shall be judged. And it's going to come back to you with the same measure that you doled it out. Don't do that. We don't want you to do that because we don't want you to have those things come into your house. Okay? So remember, if you see somebody who's doing bad things, instead of pointing the finger at them or, or taunting them by saying, ah, uh, look what you did, you did this, you did that, you need to pray for them. And y'all are learning how to pray. Haven't you learned some prayers this week? Haven't you talked to the Lord about things? Then you need to talk, you need to bring that friend to God in prayer instead of judging them. Okay, so here again, I'm giving you some information and you're gonna choose to either do the right thing or the wrong thing. You're gonna choose life and blessing or you're gonna choose death and cursing, bad things. Okay. The third thing Satan is gonna to bring to you is temptation through books that you read, movies that you watch, music that you listen to, what you do on the internet, He's gonna bring all kinds of things to you to tempt you. And let me tell you something. Here is a scripture. Matthew 6, verse 22 says this. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be healthy or single, and that means if your eye turns away from everything evil, if you do that, you don't look at evil things and you keep your eye healthy, then your whole body shall be full of light. And that's what you want. Jesus, God is light. Jesus is light. Good is light. You don't want darkness because the devil, it, that's his kingdom, the kingdom of darkness. So you don't want darkness in your body. And it says, but if thy eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If you look on evil things, you are opening your body up for darkness to come into your body. And we don't want that for you. We want you to be full of light so you can have a good life. It says, it, therefore, if uh, the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. So you want to be very careful what you look at, what you read, things that you let in your ears. See, your eyes, your ears, your mouth, your nose, those are uh, doorways for evil spirits to come in. If you, if you listen to bad stuff all the time, then spirits, evil spirits, are gonna come into your ears and they're gonna, they're gonna get into your mind and your soul and you don't want that. About 15 years ago, the Lord told me that the next thing that was gonna come out of the closet was gonna be witchcraft, that we would see it in nearly every home. And I was like, how can that be? How can people be so blinded that, that witchcraft could get into our houses? How, Lord, I don't even see how that could happen. And then shortly after that, the Harry Potter books came out. And we had witchcraft in almost every home. Now, see how sly the devil is? He takes something from the kingdom of darkness and makes an exciting book out of it so that everybody wants it. And I mean everybody just about got it. And it's full of witchcraft. It opens, see you're reading it, and you're thinking it, and it gets down into your soul and then a spirit of witchcraft can come into your life and cause lots of problem, problems for you. And we don't want that. Uh, I'll tell you how much God hates witchcraft. In Ezekiel, uh, Exodus 22:18, remember what happened to the rebellious child? 
They were stoned to death. Well, he says in Exodus 22, 18, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. If you were a witch, you were put to death. So this is nothing to play with. God is very serious about witchcraft. Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 18. He gives us a list of things that y'all are not supposed to have any, that us, we are not supposed to have anything to do with. Deuteronomy 18 verse 9. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire, who uses divination, that's witchcraft, there's all kinds of divination, uh, or an observer of times, and I'm going to tell you what these things are in a minute, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter of mediums, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things, see, it's not just the things, but all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. That's a bad thing. An abomination is something that he hates. And so he doesn't want you to be fooling with these things. He doesn't want you to touch them. He doesn't want you to listen to it. He doesn't want you to play with it. Um, let me tell you what these things are. Referring to astrology, that's uh, one who is an observer of the times. These are stargazers. This is where the horoscope comes from. This is where, uh, back in the old days, uh, uh, when a guy would meet a girl, it was real uh, cool to say, what sign are you? That's all about horoscopes. We don't fool with that stuff. That's what he's talking about in here. And it's an abomination. He hates it. God hates it. And he, it says that all that do those things, he hates. And we don't want you to be hated we, because you don't want to lose the love of God. The love of God is a wonderful thing, and we don't play around with it. Okay? A witch is one who makes use of magic, formulas, or incantations. Now that Harry Potter book was full of stuff like that and children got into that. I mean, if it worked for Harry, maybe it'll work for me. And that's very dangerous. You're playing with fire. So don't fool with these things. When the devil brings them your way, you just let it pass right on by. I don't want anything to do with that. You don't want to let those things in your doorway of your ears or your eyes because it'll bring bad things into your life. You don't want that. Okay, a necromancer, that is someone who talks to the dead. Now there are TV shows of people who do that. Yeah. It's dangerous. He instructs us not to talk to the dead. Uh, have you ever heard of a seance? Back when I was younger, Oh boy, we love slumber parties. And slumber parties were fun. There's nothing wrong with a slumber party, but sometimes the things that come out at slumber parties, there is something wrong with. Mm -hmm. They play all kinds of games that are, that are connected to witchcraft. I, I never played any of those games. I didn't even hear of them, but my daughter heard of them. And I'm not even gonna say them because all it's gonna do is cause you to wonder what it is. Then I don't want you to know what it is. But when you go to a party and somebody brings out something, let me tell you, when you get this little feeling in, the t in your tummy, listen to it. Almost like a rattlesnake. You know that feeling you would get if a rattlesnake just what came into this room? It would give you a feeling, a, a, a caution, and, and these things will give you that same feeling because Jesus is in you Amen. and he hates it. And so he's going to let you know. So listen for that. Be watchful. What did that word say about 
sober, be really? vigilant, alertly watchful, expect, especially for dangerous things. And these things are dangerous. You don't want to have anything to do with them. He's talking about, now Brother Jim talked today and all of these things were in his, I just thought, wow, this is great. Y'all pick up Brother Jim's teaching that he did earlier today because he did deliverance for all of that stuff that we've dabbled in over the years that we didn't know any better. But you're going to know better because you're hearing it tonight and you're going to have to make a choice when these things come out. Like a lot of people think that white witchcraft or white magic is okay, but it's not. That's a deception. The devil wants to make you think that white magic and white witchcraft is good, but there's no such thing. That's like saying um, chocolate covered spinach. Yuck. Yeah, I don't think so. But anyway, that it, this all falls in the same thing as like uh, palm readers. You know how people go get their palms read? Or looking in a crystal ball, Ouija boards. If anybody ever brings out a Ouija board, don't you even touch, get out of the room, yeah. leave. <laughs> if, you can, if you can call your mom and say, come get me. Yeah. You don't want to be around that. Yeah. It's a dangerous thing. It will bring bad things in your life because there are evil spirits connected to it. And then when you fool with it, the evil spirits connect to you. It's that hook, that noose. So don't touch those things. Um, and see, a lot of times, these are things that our forefathers were involved in. And so sometimes, like if, if there's going to be a teaching on these things and deliverance is going to be done, go sit in there because you don't know what your great-great-great-great-grandma and grandpa did. Okay. Another thing that's real popular right now are vampire movies. How many of you have heard about these vampire movies? Oh, yeah, yeah. You know what a vampire, what does a vampire do? What, go ahead. Right. Is that what all, of, all the rest of y'all know, that that's what that is? A vampire drinks blood. Now, I know that the young people think that's the coolest thing. But let me tell you what God thinks about it. I want you to look at Leviticus, Leviticus, excuse me, <laughs> Leviticus. Okay, Leviticus chapter 17. Leviticus chapter 17, verse 10. Now listen to, listen to what God thinks about these vampire movies. <coughs> and whatsoever man of the house of Israel, now that could say who is a believer of God, <coughs> because that was, those were God's children, God's people, or of the strangers that sojourned among you who lived with the, the Israelites, any man who eateth any manner of blood, I that's God. God is saying, I will set, even set my face against that soul that eateth blood and will cut him off from among his people. And that could mean death. They're cut off. You can't get any more cut off than being killed or dying. And God goes on to say, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. You can't think that's cool. It may sound cool and people talk about it like it's cool, but what does God say? My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. They don't know this. They don't know this. All of these young people who have not gone to church, have not learned the word of God, they don't know that this is not cool. It's deadly. And it is forbidden by God. He doesn't like it. And you're going to have to make a choice when these things come along. Are you going to choose the bad thing that's going to bring bad things into your life? 
or are you going to choose the good thing that's going to bring the blessings of God into your life? We don't want you to have bad things in your life. So I just wanted you to know what God thinks about all these vampire movies. Okay. Um, the, another thing that Satan is going to try to tempt you with, you older ones may have already been tempted with it. The younger ones may be tempted with it even now because it gets younger and younger and younger. The problem all the time is somebody might want you to drink some beer or some liquor. Yeah, it's not unheard of. Children, when mom and dad are out of the house, they get into their stuff. Because, and Satan tempts them to do it because he wants to get you into the bad things so bad things will come into your life. He wants you to get off the good path of God and follow him. He wants you because you belong to God. So you're going to have to make a choice when that time comes. But here's the knowledge that you need to know about alcohol. Okay, first I want to read 1 Corinthians 6.19, and then we're going to talk about the effects of alcohol. 1 Corinthians 6.19. Now I bet you've heard these scriptures too. See, a lot of people think, well, it's my body. I can do what I want. But let me tell you what God thinks about that train of thought. It says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, what? This is what God is saying when somebody says that. It's my body. I'll do it what I want to. God is saying, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have of God? And you are not your own, for you were bought with a price. Therefore, you need to glorify God in your body and in your spirit. Not just in your spirit, but in your body too, because it belongs to God. When Jesus hung on the cross, and shed every drop of his blood, he paid the price for your body. It really isn't your own. He's letting you live in it, but it's not your body. It belongs to him. It's a very sacred thing. It's the temple where he lives. You wouldn't do things in God's house. You wouldn't go in God's house and spray paint on the wall <coughs> or anything like that. No. You have respect, and that's how you should be with your body. You should respect your body. Okay, now I'm going to tell you about alcohol. I looked up some words about alcohol. What number is that for? Okay, first of all, I'm going to read some scriptures. Proverbs 21, 20, verse 1. Proverbs. I'm going to show you just a couple of scriptures in here because I want you to know that it's in it's in God's word. Proverbs 20, verse one. Are y'all learning anything? Yeah. Okay. Nobody fell asleep yet. How about over here? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Chapter 20, verse one says this. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink, raging. And whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. You know what that means? There is a stupid spirit connected to it. Amen. A stupid spirit. And let me tell you what that word mocker means. The word mocker means make mouthy. Yeah. Boy, someone drinks wine, they get real mouthy. Yeah. They get loud and they get mouthy. They just got a yak, 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 yak. They're mouthing off and it's bitter. It's bitter and angry uh, contempt. You know why? Because people have anger. 
Do you know anger is an evil spirit? You could have even been born with anger, an evil spirit of anger. You're a little tiny baby, but you've got this thousands and thousands year old demon of anger in you, and it's just waiting for you to grow up so it can act out. And wine will help it. It'll let that angry man out. But you know, Jesus shed his blood to deliver you from things like that. Wine is surely not, it's going to let it out, but it's not going to get it out. Okay? It also says a mocker is someone who ridicules while laughing. Ridicules while laughing. Ha <laughs> ha, you're so stupid. That's what they do. That's what that is. It's, it's awful. Okay? And it says strong drink is raging. And that word raging means violent and uncontrollable anger. You know, somebody can just be the nicest person and you give them something strong to drink and they turn into a monster? Mm -hmm. Do you know that most of the time when women get beaten, it's by somebody who has, is drunk? Mm -hmm. Children who are hurt, it's by somebody who is drunk. Mm -hmm. Carloads of families are killed by some, somebody who drinks and that stupid spirit is there and they get in the car when they can't even function and they get in the car and wreck somebody and kill people who didn't deserve to die. It's a serious thing. It's evil. Do you know you can pass a store where they sell all this stuff and it says beer, wine, spirits. Mmm, come buy you a bottle of spirits. And they're evil spirits. They're always evil spirits in those bottles. Yeah, there's not just one spirit. Mm -mm. You know what happens when you drink and those spirits are there? They, that, well, we've already said they make you stupid. And they give you false courage. You'll end up doing things you would never do if you hadn't drank it. It won't. It is a tool that Satan uses to kill, steal, and destroy your life. Stay away from it. God wants you to stay away from it. It's connected to death and curses. Do you want that? No. 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 Okay, it also says in Proverbs 31, 4, that it will make you forget the law and pervert justice. <laughs> You'll just forget the law. You'll drive and speed and steal, break into places. Isaiah 55, 11 says wine inflames them. See, it's inflammatory. It's like throwing gasoline on a fire. That, that's what it means to inflame something. Um, Isaiah 28, 7 says, I th let me see if that's not Proverbs. It's not, no, okay, that's right, okay. Okay, it's Isaiah then. Isaiah 28, 7 says, strong drink causes you to err it causes you to go out of the way. It causes you to be, it causes you to be out of the way. You err in vision, yeah. messes up your sight. It'll mess up your spiritual sight too. It'll cause you to stumble. Have you ever seen anybody drunk? They can't walk. And then they fall down and get hurt. And it causes you to err in judgment. You can't, you don't even have good judgment. Hosea 4.11 says, harlotry, that means whoredom. It means idolatry, turning to something other than God. And wine and new wine taketh away the heart. Do you know what that word means, heart? It means, figuratively, it means the will the intellect, listen to this, the ability to hold. 
It messes with your mind. You can't even hold information. It, it takes away your understanding. You don't want that to happen. That's like being brain dead. Okay, so that's enough about alcohol. That's enough that you should know you don't want it. There's nothing but destruction in it. Okay, so that's another thing because, boy, that's when kids, when, when children get to be teenagers, they think it's cool, but it's not. It's connected to death and it's connected to cursing. And God doesn't want you to have that in your life. Okay, let's see what the other thing was. Oh yeah, the same thing about the wine and beer and whiskey and all those things is um, smoking pot or taking drugs. Somebody say, oh come on, just try it, just try it, come on. That's the devil because you know it's wrong but the devil's going to try to get you to do it because he wants to get you off of that right path. He wants to pull you out of life and blessing. He wants to drag you over to his side where there's nothing but death and cursing and trouble and problems. You don't want that. Tobacco is a drug. You know, um, both my mom and dad smoked when I was growing up. And I had two brothers and they both smoked. But I thought that was a stinking of stuff. I just, you know, I hated going anywhere because I always smelled like cigarette smoke and I didn't even smoke. All right. Is that a roach? <laughs> a cricket? Just a distraction. Okay. That's from the kingdom of darkness. That's my Okay. So that's why it's in front of you. Fear draws. Okay. So, um, okay. So smoking cigarettes, so they'll, somebody's going to offer you a cigarette. Somebody that smokes, a friend that would not be good for you to be friends with is going to try. Have you ever heard misery loves company? Mm -hmm. They're already miserable. They want someone else to be miserable with them. Right. They don't want you to have a good life. Their, their life is not good. They don't want you to have a good life. That's how the devil works. He wants to bring everybody over into his uh, junk. Okay, um, you know what the Lord told me? Because I had a son that smoked marijuana and he got arrested. You know why? It's against the law. Marijuana is against the law. If you do something that's against the law, the law is going to come take you and put you in jail. You don't want to go to jail. That's not where you belong. That's not where God's children go. Amen. Well, some do. <laughs> but that's why we have deliverance. Um, but you don't want to go to jail. That just begins your trouble. You know what happens when you go to jail? You get a record. Somebody, You know that purchase order I was talking about a while ago? Well, there's another kind of record where your name goes on it and you don't ever get it off. It's hard to get it off. And then once somebody knows you have a record and you go and you want to try to get a job and they'll see that, have you ever been arrested? They'll ask you that. When you go to get a job, have you ever been arrested? And you put yes and they just pass you over and go to the next guy. Because they don't want those lawbreakers working in their place. I'll tell you what, if you break the law, you'll break the rules at where you work. And they don't want that. So stay away from those things that are against the law because we don't want you to get in trouble. But what God told me about the marijuana, because I wondered why this grown up, he's a man, and he got arrested for marijuana. See, there's a stupid spirit attached to it. You just get stupid when you smoke pot. You get lazy and you don't want to do anything. There's a stupid spirit attached to it. You don't want to be stupid, do you? Stay away from marijuana. Stay away from alcohol. Um, anyway, God told me 
because I, I didn't understand it. It's like, he's a man. What, what in the world? He's not a 15-year-old kid. He's not a, he's not, he shouldn't be stupid anymore. He should be all grown up and mature. And God said, because his mental and emotional development stopped when at the age he started smoking marijuana. It causes you to be immature. It causes you not to develop right. It causes, just like when you break the law and you get arrested and they take you to jail and you can't do anything. Well, when you smoke pot, it arrests your brain. And you can't do anything. You can't think right. You can't learn right. It arrests your development. You don't grow up right. You stay uh, immature. You don't grow up. You don't want that, do you? No. Okay. So we want to stay away from that stuff. We don't want you to have arrested development, which could be the cause of learning disabilities. And the serious thing about it is, maybe you never smoked pot, but maybe your parents did or your grandparents, you know, were alcoholics or whatever. And, and then that arrested development, see that spirit, it, it nooses on. And then it goes down the family line. It stays there until it's broken. And it can, be, it can be affecting you. And if you choose to do it, it affects you. It affects your children. It affects your children's children. And your children's children's children. You don't want to do that. See, people think it's not going to hurt anybody. But yes, it does. It hurts a lot of bodies. So you don't want to do that. And the last thing I want to talk to you about is sex. You know, on TV, they make a big deal out of it. Movies make a big deal out of it. Your friends will make a big deal out of it. And Satan will come and say, you need to try it. Just like the alcohol, the pot, the cigarettes, everything else. Hey, no problem. Well, I want to tell you how God looks at it so that you will know. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and this is the last thing we're going to talk about, and then we're going to go home and go to bed. Hallelujah. <laughs> Mama said so. Remember, y'all are all my children tonight. <laughs> okay, 1 Corinthians 6. Let me get to it. Huh? 6. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, seven, seven. Keep me on track here. First Corinthians, I can't even find First Corinthians. Seven, verse one. No, yeah, one. Okay, now this church in Corinth was having some problems. They were misbehaving. People were doing things they weren't supposed to be doing, and so they wrote Paul a letter, and Paul writes this back. Now, concerning the things about which you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Now, isn't that a funny thing to say? Now, he's not talking about, like, if I ran over there and, and touched Mr. Bijou on the shoulder. They're not talking about that kind of touch. Let me tell you what touch means. Okay? okay? Where did I write that? <laughs> Let me go back to my notes. The word touch means to attach oneself to. Isn't that interesting? You wouldn't think the word touch meant that, would you? It means attach oneself to, to fasten. So I'm not just holding hands. No, I'm all connected up. We're not just holding hands. We're touching. Our whole body is touching. That's the kind of touch it's talking about. It is good for a man not to touch a woman. Why? Verse 2. For a woman not to touch a man. Well, I'm, it, the scripture says for a man not to touch a woman. <laughs> but nevertheless, this is why. It says nevertheless to avoid fornication. And that means sex. Let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. 
So you see that touching, that kind of touch, hanging on each other all the time, and you know, that's not proper behavior. The world has made it proper behavior, but it's not proper behavior. So when you get a girlfriend or you get a boyfriend, it's okay to hold hands. It's okay to sit on the couch and talk or talk on the phone, but it's not okay to lay down on the couch. Yes? How do you think they get to hang on each other? You start off with right. your hands. There you go. Well, that's true. You start holding up. That's right. That's right. But there is a proper touch. But when it goes beyond the outer, you know, just dump, dump, just dump. You're right. I mean, yeah. And never be in a room by yourself. You know, if I had it to do over again, well, we lived way out in the woods and they ran in groups. They didn't really date. You know, there was never, well, while I was looking at them. <laughs> Yeah, we live way out in the woods. We live way, we live, yeah, we live 20 miles from anywhere, so. <laughs> so, and, and, and dating has really kind of changed, you know. The guy doesn't come and pick up the girl like they used to in my day. The guy used to come and take you to the movies, you know. And so, but what I'm talking about is, you don't get alone and you don't um, touch each other in a way that's not appropriate because it leads to sex and sex outside of the marriage is wrong it says let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband now the world doesn't know the knowledge of god that it that that belongs to a husband and a wife only mm -hmm. it's not just for some cute guy and cute girl no god says no it's for a man and a woman, a wife and a husband. Yeah. <coughs> that, that is under the blessing and the life of God. When you don't do it like that, it's under death and cursing. It brings so many problems. And if that does happen and then you marry, some people think they make it right by getting married, but you start the marriage off with a curse. Then they have to come to Lake Hamilton and get it all straightened out. <laughs> so do it right from the beginning. Don't don't get touchy. Don't get touchy. Touchy -feely. Yeah, feely. Touchy feely with the opposite sex. Listen to this. We're gonna go on with the word touch. It says to attach oneself to, to fasten, to set on fire. To kindle. To kindle is to start burning, arouse, excite. It has to do with feelings. It wakes up passion. You don't, that, that's not right. Passion belongs in the marriage. Not just anybody. It stirs, it's a deeply stirring and ungovernable like fire. Deeply stirring and ungovernable. That means you can't, you can't contain it. It's like a wildfire. You might, you know, there's good fire and there's bad fire. I can make the fire in our wood burning stove at home and it heats our house. That's a good fire. I could pile up some leaves in the middle of my living room and start a fire. That would be a bad fire. And that's what this is talking about. It's bad fire. It will burn you. It can destroy you. And so we don't want you to be destroyed. Let me tell you, girls, we already read in the Word that your body doesn't belong to you, right? And right now, you are living with your mom and dad. But your body, even though you're little right now, one day you're going to have a husband. And your body belongs to your husband. Doesn't belong to anybody else. Belongs to your husband. Your future, your future husband. And guys, your body belongs to your 
future wife. Mm. And I want you to know that God is a great matchmaker. You need to start praying now. Lord, yes, prepare you. my man. Amen. Lord, prepare my woman. Amen. Keep me a wife. Keep me a husband. Amen. We don't want one of these that's been all over the world and with many, many people. You know why? Remember that noose in the hook? And you become so tight like the net. And then, if you're not married, if you do that and you leave, part of you goes with them. Part of you. Part of your soul goes with them. And part of their soul stays with you. Now, you've got two people in you, maybe even more. But it, it begins to mess with your mind. It can cause confusion. It can cause all kinds of mental problems. We don't want that for you. God likes purity. He wants you to keep yourself for your husband. Yes. Guys, he wants you to keep yourself yes. for whoever your wife will be so that you can have life and blessings and not death and cursings. I, I pray I haven't overstepped any parental bounds here by saying that, but you need to hear it. Parents don't usually say these things to their children. But the world sure does. The world sure does, but it's perverted. The world wants you to go Satan's way. Yes, the world is very bold to say things that we fail to say to our children. And that's why I want you to have this knowledge because you can never say, nobody told me. Because I'm telling you tonight, because I love you. And because God loves you. And he wants you to have a good life. Amen. Okay? Amen. All right, now I'm going to pray. And then we're going to go home and go to bed. Okay. Well, Father, I just thank you for this evening. I thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to your most precious children that you compare to your kingdom. You liken them to your kingdom. I want to be like them. I want to I be so trusting of you and, and have fun and love to laugh and play. That's how I want to be. I have enjoyed watching y'all this week. Okay, so right now, Father, I just bind any spirit right now that would keep these boys and girls from retaining this word. I bind and break the power of any spirit that would keep them from retaining this word in their mind, in their hearts, in their spirits. I speak to every seed that's been planted tonight, a supernatural rooting that it'll take root and grow to full maturity. Yes. Holy Spirit, I ask you to bring this information back to their memory when they Amen. have need of it. When Amen. Satan comes Amen. to them to tempt them, Lord, they will remember what is written in your word and how you feel about it, and they will run from these things so that it will not give them a bad life so they can choose life and blessing and resist the devil so that he will flee from them and Satan right now in the name of Jesus I call down fire from heaven to destroy every altar that's been erected for any of these children sitting here and for those that will hear this message I find and break the curse of the firstborn how many of you are the oldest in your family I bind and break the curse of the firstborn. Yes. And let me tell you, you didn't do anything to get that curse. You know how it came? God said, every firstborn is mine. So naturally, Satan says, mine. Do you know that? So I break that curse right now off of the firstborn of every family represented here. Not only on this side, but on that side too. In Jesus' name, I break that curse in the name of Jesus Christ. I bind and command to leave the unholy angel that was assigned to you at birth. Because you know what? God assigned a guardian angel. So Satan said, I'm going to give him one too. And it's the one that will try to get you to go his way. 
I give it leave right now in Jesus' name. I command every unholy angel, go in the name of Jesus. I command in the name of Jesus, familiar spirits of drugs, alcohol, fornication, and any other evil spirit that came down the family line to go. Familiar spirits, go in Jesus' name. Those spirits that draw that stuff to them that they don't even know about, bringing those kind of people into their lives I just bind and break every familiar spirit and I command you to go in Jesus' name. Get away from them in Jesus' name. They're going. They're gone. They're gone. They're gone. They're gone. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I bind the prince of the power of the air that worketh in the children of disobedience. I bind you and I break your power off of every one of us here tonight. In the name of Jesus, the prince of the power of the air that worketh in the children of disobedience. I command you to go. I break your power now. In the name of Jesus, go. I bind their feet to your path of righteousness, Lord. I bind their feet to the path of righteousness. And I assign mighty angels to go with them and surround each one shoulder to shoulder that no evil penetrate. And if ever an evil spirit comes, I ask you to open the eyes of the person that the evil spirits are in, that they see the mighty angels of God around them and they will turn and go the other way. And now, Lord, I bless them. Yes, amen. Lord, I just ask that you would just drop down right now every blessing that you have for them, every blessing with their name on it. Satan, I command you to loose anything you've stolen from them in the name of Jesus. You loose it right now. We call it into their family name. We call it into their families right now in Jesus' name. Lord, I ask you to bless their homes, bless their moms, bless their dads. Bless their grandparents and any other caretaker that takes care of them in the name of Jesus. And I call forth every mighty man of God sitting over here. For every young man, I say, mighty man of God, come forth in Jesus' name. And I say, mighty woman of God, come forth in Jesus' name. And Lord, we just thank you for them and we praise you for them. We love you guys. We hope you'll come back and come back and come back and come back and never forget what you heard tonight. And that these are added to every all the Ten Commandments and everything else that you know. Okay. Uh, Jerry McGee asked me to tell y'all not to let the sun go down on your anger. And that is a very important. It says, lest the devil get a foothold. So when, when you get angry at mom or dad or friends or teachers or whoever, you know, you may not feel it in your heart, but you, you say it with your mouth. And, and, and then it, it goes into your heart. You say it with your mouth, you hear it with your ears, just like faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. You say it with your mouth, you hear it with your ears. It drops down into your heart and it becomes real. So be sure that if anybody makes you angry, you say, Lord, I forgive them for doing that. And know that it's not the person that did it, but there's an evil spirit that caused you to be angry. And you can even say, I speak to that evil spirit and I command it to go in Jesus' name. You've got power. You really do. In the name of Jesus. It is the name of Jesus. So we love you guys. Thank you, Lord. It's time to go to bed now. <laughs>